Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time. You said you make all things beautiful in its time. And I thank you, Lord, that it's not by accident those that are here are here. It's not by accident this message is for today. And so, Father, I thank you. I pray you would anoint me to be able to speak clearly what you're saying to impart to your people so that they can receive from you, not from me, and that they will know it's from you. And God, it will be transformational and it would change their lives in such a way, God, where you would get the glory, you would get the honor from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This place, y'all don't need glasses yet. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 says this. Do you not know that the unrighteous, one version says, do you not know that those who practice doing wrong, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Nor will fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I want to talk to you from the subject, enjoying God's benefits, enjoying the kingdom benefits, enjoying the kingdom benefits, okay? If one was to look up on Google, everybody knows about Google, Google or Yahoo, whatever you look up, Bing, if you was to look up the greatest kingdom ever on the earth, you might hear such names as the Roman Empire, the Portuguese Empire, the Spanish, the Qing Dynasty, the Russian, the Mongol Empire. These are empires, are kingdoms that would arise if you were looking for what is in this world considered the greatest kingdoms of all time. And in order for these that are mentioned to even be considered as a kingdom, it means that the land where these places are must be owned and the people of this land must be politically run by a monarch. A monarch is one individual. This individual will be known as an emperor or a king. And every kingdom has a king. And the king's kingdom usually consists of great cities and protectorates, uh, lands that are protected by him, and, and colonies. And, and each kingdom usually has explorers. And those explorers are, go out and they conquer other lands and they claim them in the name of that king. Mm -hmm. And one of the most famous kings ever was a king by the name of Cyrus II of Persia. The Bible even holds him in the highest esteem. He was given the name Cyrus the Great, and he built what was known as the Achaemenid Empire. Some believe he was holding dominion over the largest kingdom in history because his territory stretched over more than three continents. He was considered a military innovator and a political genius, and he made his presence felt across the ancient world. He was a central figure in the history of both Eastern and Western civilizations. He was inspirational to subsequent conquerors who would follow him. He was a hero of the Persian Empire 
around the time of 600 to 500 B.C. Like Cyrus and other kings who ruled kingdoms, everything was theirs, or it became theirs, or it became a part of their kingdom territory. And their laws were the ones that were implemented. And their culture was what was implemented. And their selected leaders were put in place. And their language was the language everybody learned and used as the official language of that territory. These kings influenced every part of the society for their own purpose to be accomplished. They had the final say in every single matter. People were to do whatever the king said, or they could only do whatever the king would allow. Now, those of us who grew up in places where there was not a king or queen or monarchy or oligarchy, someone who is in absolute control of everything, don't quite understand what it means to live and function in a kingdom. Those who have grown up in places where there is a monarch or a king or a queen or someone who is the supreme ruler, they understand much more of what a kingdom is. That means us in the Western civilization culture who have grown up under democracy, who have grown up under a republic, who understand government from that standpoint, usually really struggle to understand what it means or what it looks like to operate in a kingdom with a monarch. <laughs> we don't understand. We struggle to understand how a kingdom truly works because it's a concept we have not learned. It's something that we have not lived in physically. Therefore, since we have this other concept of what government is supposed to be like, we bring that concept, our own experience, and our own ideology based on what we believe. We bring that into this whole concept of what a kingdom is. Anybody know where I'm going here today? For example, we have been indoctrinated that democracy is the best form of government as it allows the majority of the people to rule what happens in it. In this form of government, people have rights. They have choices. What they think and what they believe is to be recognized. However, in a kingdom, it's drastically different. <laughs> A king or a queen, the leader, he decides for everyone else the rules for living, and he makes all of the final judgments. Of, now watch this. Of course, people, they get to decide if they want to follow the rules <laughs> or not. In some cases, I guess people can leave a kingdom they don't like, and go to another place in the world, another territory, right? So that they can be somewhere where they like. And if they can't, then they have to just deal with the consequences that come from staying in a kingdom that they don't want to follow the rules in. In a kingdom, your fate is not left up to you, but ultimately to the king in the matters of the kingdom. In summary, you cannot have a kingdom without a king, and you can, and to be a part of any kind of kingdom, you must follow the rulership of that king. Now, let me divert just a minute from where I'm going. Just ask this question. Could it be that we have had as a church such a minimal impact in our country because people struggle to understand that the Jesus they say they serve as Lord and Savior 
and, and that he is actually a king with a kingdom, which has rules that are not up for discussion. <laughs> because, see, in America, our mentality is, I'm an American. I have rights. I got rights. I got rights. We got background music for that part of the sermon. <laughs> We forgot to tell everybody to silence their phone, huh? We got right. So, so we have a hard time in the body of Christ understanding that, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you gave your life to Jesus, when you made him king of your life, you no longer have rights because you gave up your rights to follow the king and operate and function and live in his kingdom according to his rules. So we struggle with that. We find ourselves in so much trouble and heartache because our mindsets are convinced that when it comes to anything that has to do with our life and what's going on, that we have options. But you don't understand, I got options. I can make choices. I got decisions. I got rights. <laughs> That's what you were taught. But you're not operating in the kingdom of this world anymore. You're operating in the kingdom of God. So in our passage today, we have a mention of a kingdom. The kingdom mentioned belongs to God. It is his kingdom. And this kingdom is mentioned throughout all of the scriptures. And just in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John alone, the kingdom is mentioned over 85 times. And so from God's holy word that keeps mentioning this kingdom, what can we understand about God's kingdom? So there's some stuff that I want to share with you, some points that help us to understand God's kingdom and how it operates. And I think this is going to be very important for you. Here's the first thing. It's not the only kingdom that there is. It's first thing we need to understand when we talk about God's kingdom. It is not the only kingdom that there is. There are other kingdoms, the Bible tells us, that are of this world. So you have the kingdom of God, which is talked about, and you have other kingdoms, the Bible tells us, are the kingdoms of this world. And it's mentioned all through scriptures about the kingdom of this world. Another term is the kingdom of men. And there's one more kingdom we got to talk about besides the kingdom of God. You guys probably know about that kingdom. This kingdom is the antithesis of antithesis of the kingdom of light. It is the kingdom of darkness. Instead of the kingdom of heaven, it is the, king, it is the kingdom of Satan. And Satan has a kingdom. There are people that don't believe Satan has a kingdom. But it's very clear in Scripture that Satan has a kingdom. Even Jesus said when they accused him of casting out a demon by being a demon, Jesus said, now a kingdom cannot stand if it's divided. And if, and if, if Satan is casting himself out, Jesus said, then how can his kingdom stand? So he lets us know that there is another kingdom and it's called the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. So we got to see that God's kingdom is not the only kingdom at work. Satan's kingdom has a throne, it says in Revelation 2 and 13. Not only is Satan with a kingdom, 
But what I find interesting is he's, he's given names. He's given the name. It's called the prince of the air. Prince. He's, he's called the ruler. He's called um, the, the god of this age. That's a little G. It ain't a big G. So he's got these titles. Now, what's interesting in my study is I found out that no matter all through the scripture, even though it gives him all these names for this kingdom, it never gives him the title king. If you look to the scripture, even though, now remember I said every kingdom has a king. Satan has his kingdom, but he's never referred to as a king. Now, this should help you as a Christian because the Bible refers to us as kings and priests. That means God gave us a title that Satan doesn't even have. And the title, the reason why God gives us that title, that's why when it says that he is the king of kings, it ain't talking about the king of kings of this world. He's talking about us. He is the king of us. He is the king of kings. That, that we have that title. Guess, guess what? Because you can't, in the spiritual realm, you cannot appoint yourself as a king. You cannot give yourself the title of being a king. In the natural realm, men can appoint themselves as kings in the secular. In the natural realm, men can say, we're going to select a king. But in the spiritual, when God selects a king, that's God giving that ordination. And it can't be done in the natural. It can only be done in the spirit. That's why Satan is never given the title of a king. Because God won't give him that title in the spiritual realm. So we got titles that Satan does. He's never a king. He can't appoint himself as a king, but he's given the title of a prince. And everybody knows that a prince usually is like the son of the king, right? That, that, that they're always a step under. They're, they're never the one in charge. They're always underneath somebody else. The kingdom of men or the kingdom of this world, it says in Luke chapter 4, that man was given a kingdom. It says that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, God said, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness and let them rule, right? Let them have dominion. Do you know the word dominion is the same thing as kingdom? So when God created man and woman in the beginning, he gave them a kingdom. He gave them dominion. He gave them a kingdom. And what is the kingdom that he gave them? The kingdom of this earth. God, is, his kingdom is in heaven. He gave man a kingdom, and the kingdom he gave man was the kingdom of this earth. Now, men gave their kingdom to Satan. So, you know I've been using this board, so I brought the board today, and I know I have a lot of drawing to do, and, and God is blessing me with my drawing. So I got here a little early so that I can, I can draw some stuff because I didn't want to take up so much time doing our time to draw it. So I pre-drew some stuff, and then I'm just going to fill some stuff in in this drawing that I, I drew uh, talking about the kingdom. <laughs> Pastor Ben, you're doing all right now. Pastor Ben, you're doing all right. Yeah, I drew this. Usually I get people to draw. So, so here we have over here the kingdom, the kingdom of, of God. It's also called the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And then we have over here, Satan got kicked out of heaven. I saw Satan fall like lightning. He got kicked, and then remember in the story of Job, it says that where you come from, he, he's, he's roaming to and fro throughout the, the, from the earth, back up, back and forth. See, and that's why he's called the prince of the air. He, he, he didn't have a stable kingdom. He, he just roams. So here we have uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of Satan, but we'll just, it's the kingdom of darkness. So when God created man, God created man, and like I said, it says, let them have dominion. That's a kingdom. God gave them a kingdom to rule. 
right? So here we have the other kingdom. We got three kingdoms represented here, and this is the kingdom of men. Another word we can use is the kingdom of this world. Okay, that, that uh, goes with that. So we have the kingdom of God, which is the highest. We got over here the kingdom of darkness, which got kicked out of heaven. And then God creates, gives, gives, uh, creates a man and gives him dominion. And so now we have the kingdom of men operating here. And so now the kingdom of men, who are a reflection of the king of kings, the reason why he gave them this earth and told them to rule over it was that they would rule the way he ruled in heaven so that it would be a reflection of him. They're under him. He is the king of kings. He appoints his kings over the earth to rule. Now, what did they do with the kingdom that God gave them? They gave their kingdom to the kingdom of darkness. They tra it, it, get, it, it got moved from, from being under the kingdom of God to being over here under the kingdom of it's still the kingdom of men, but now they're over here on this side. They're under the kingdom of darkness. This is why you have so much craziness in the world today. People talking about, well, God is sovereign, God's in charge. Yeah, but God gave man a choice, <laughs> right? And as long as they're connected to him, then we, we will see the kingdom of God's rule through us in the earth. But when we decided not to submit to his will and his way and his purpose, and we allowed ourselves, given our dominion over to the kingdom of darkness, now the kingdom of darkness is influencing us. And this is what you see in our world today. The influence of the kingdom of darkness that is greater right now than the, kingdom of the, influ the, than the influence of the kingdom of light. In all areas where you see chaos and disorder and destruction and death, the kingdom of darkness is ruling in that particular area. And then there are areas where the kingdom of God is ruling. That's why I have it here twice. I didn't, I, I, initially this was moved over here. But God had an answer. And God had an answer through his son, Jesus Christ, so that he can have a kingdom again under him that where he can rule. He can bring the kingdom, we pray, let, this, let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so we have an opportunity now to submit now. And so what we have going on in our world today is we have two kingdoms that are working, that are fighting, that are battling in the earth realm. There is no fight in the spiritual realm. <laughs> God already, his kingdom is above all kingdoms. He's already in charge. He's already in control. He's already sovereign. He's already above all. He already has all dominion and all power. So there is no battle here. The battle is here on the earth with some men who are submitted to the kingdom of darkness versus other men who are now committed, who are now submitted to the kingdom of God. This is what's going on right now. Colossians 1 and 13 says he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us, those of us who believe on him, he's brought us into the kingdom of, the, of his son who he loves. Acts 26 and 18 says to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light. From the dominion, kingdom, right? Dominion's kingdom. From the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God. That's what the scriptures say. Here's the second thing we must learn about a kingdom. God's kingdom, it says in John 18 and 36, God's kingdom is not of this world. See, God's kingdom didn't come from this world. That's what it means. God's kingdom is active in this world. It's active through what? The kingdom of men. But God's kingdom is not from here. That's why Jesus told them, my kingdom is not of this world. God's kingdom, 
is above. God's kingdom is in heaven. We have to bring the kingdom of heaven into the earth through the men who are submitted under the king. So God's kingdom is not here. The Lord's throne, the Bible says in Psalms 103, is established in heaven. And his kingdom rules everything from there. Mm -hmm. When it says he rules everything from there, we know ultimately it will be his rule. But right now we don't see his complete and full rule because he's given time to man to decide whose rule they want to be submitted to. Number three, God's kingdom, that is, in the heavens, the Bible says, has come down to the earth. The kingdom is the rule and the reign of God. John says it this way, the reason why the Son of God who came from heaven to earth was manifested was so that he might destroy the works of the devil that he might bring the kingdom to the earth and that he might destroy the works of the kingdom of darkness. So God's kingdom has come to the earth. Look at your neighbor and say, a greater king has shown up. Nothing to worry about. The greater king has shown up now. Fourth thing we need to understand about God's kingdom. The kingdom that of God is glorious. And it is everlasting. And it will conquer every other kingdom. That's what the Bible teaches us. The kingdom of God is a glorious kingdom. And it is a kingdom that will never end. It will last forever. And it will conquer every other kingdom that has ever existed. Every kingdom of men. Because you know you got a lot of kingdoms. We got kingdom of men. You got a lot of kingdoms under here, right? So it will conquer all the kingdoms of men as well as the kingdom of darkness. Let's go to the next one. Fifth reason thing we need to understand about God's kingdom. God's kingdom must be declared in order for men in this world to know about it. Everybody don't know about this kingdom. And the only way other people are going to know that this kingdom has come down from heaven to earth is it has to be preached. It has to be declared. It has to be proclaimed. You've got to share it. The Bible says they won't know if we don't share it. When Jesus started his ministry, the first words that came out of his mouth was, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent because the kingdom of God is here now. And that was the message that Jesus preached. So it has to be declared. The Bible in Matthew 24 and 14 says the gospel must be preached in every nation to every nation as a testimony. And then the end can come. The end cannot come until the gospel has been preached to every nation in every language. Hmm. Six. Here's the next thing we need to understand about God's kingdom. The only way to become a part of this kingdom is you must be born again. You must receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's no other way to become part of the kingdom. There's no other process to become part of the kingdom. There's no works that you can do to become part of the kingdom of God. The only way that you can become a part of this kingdom, the Bible says in in John uh, chapter 3, Nicodemus said, was talking to Jesus, and Jesus told him, if you want to inherit eternal life, you have to be born again. What does that mean? You got to believe on me. That's the only way you can see the kingdom of God, he told him. Our righteousness is not enough. It's the only way to get into the kingdom. You don't listen to the lies. There's many ways to God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There's only one way to get into the kingdom. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except they go through me. Number seven. Other thing we must understand about God's kingdom is in God's kingdom, God, I love this part. Everybody 
is royalty. Everybody is part of the royal family in God's kingdom. See, see other kingdoms, everybody, most people are servants. They serve the king. Their life is to serve the king. Their life is to give the king whatever he wants. But it, it, we're servants in God's kingdom, and he's our king, but we're a family. We're a royal family. And it's different because guess what? Family gets inheritance. That's why we're his family, because we get an inheritance. We get the blessing. We get the favor. So we're family. That's why we call him father, and he calls us his children, because we're family in this kingdom. Who doesn't want to be a part of a kingdom where everybody is connected to the king, can call him father, got the benefits of the king, got the inheritance from the king? Who would want to go with, along with another kingdom where you ain't got no benefits, you have no inheritance, and all you got to do is slave and work for that king? I'm choosing this kingdom. God's kingdom is completely different. We are ch children of the most high God. Our king connects to us as his father. We are his children. We are royal family, members of the family of the king, receiving every benefit, enjoying everything that he has to offer. God, we're not, he, he said to his disciples, I don't even call you servants, I call you my friends. And this is what I love about this kingdom, being in the kingdom of God, because the Bible tells us we're not even limited in the level of intimacy, our connection, our friendship, our closeness to the king. Now you understand kingdom and kings you, from the book of Esther, remember? She couldn't come before the king unless the king called for her. And so she took a chance to go before the king, but the kingdom we're in, you don't have to take a chance and wonder if you're going to be harmed if you go into the king without him asking for you. Because in this kingdom, you can access him at any time. And not only can you access the king at any time, but the king is ready to receive you. You can have as much of the king as you want. It's up to you how close you want to be to this king. Amen. You can have the intimacy you want. Here's the next thing we need to understand about kingdom. The kingdom of heaven this is important, is not as much a place as it is a person. Because when we always think of the kingdom of God, we always think of a location, a place. But it's not as much a place as it is a person, as it is a presence, as it is a power, as it is a peace. The kingdom of God can exist anywhere. Because the kingdom of God is not limited to one location or one place because the kingdom is a person. The kingdom is a power. The kingdom is a presence. The presence of God. So we have to change our, our thought process when we think about the kingdom of God. Because if we only think of it as a place, then we will think we can only access the kingdom of God when we get to heaven. When the truth is, you can access the kingdom of God right now. It's not an actual place. It's a, it's a person in that place. <laughs> It's a kingdom is activity versus a place. It's a state of activity. It's a state of being ruled. It's a state of bringing the rule to somebody else. That's what's going on with the kingdom. Romans 14 and 17 says it this way, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Luke 17 and 20, the disciples ask Jesus, well, when is the kingdom of God going to come? And Jesus answers them this way. Jesus says, the kingdom is not coming in ways that can be observed. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. 
The kingdom of God is in the midst of, what do you mean, Jesus? He's telling the disciples the kingdom of God is not in something you can observe and look at. It's in the midst of you. Well, who was in the midst of the disciples? Jesus was. He said, you don't even realize the kingdom of God has come, and it's right here in front of you. <laughs> it's me. It's the spirit of God. Here's the last thing we need to understand about the kingdom. It is up to each man as to which kingdom is going to be seen in operation in his life. It is up to each man and woman to which of these kingdom is going to be seen in operation in their life. Matthew 6 and 33, seek first the kingdom. Live in obedience to how the kingdom works. Pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom citizens can bring God's influence into the kingdom of this world or into the kingdom of darkness where it is. In heaven, the kingdom of God is all light, it's pure, it's holy, it's righteous. You ain't got to worry about nothing there. But here on the earth, we got another kingdom to deal with. But we can bring the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of holiness into the midst of kingdom of darkness and overcome it. That's powerful. Because we serve a greater kingdom. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. It's up to each man as to which kingdom is going to be seen in operation. We see that further in Matthew chapter 16, verse 9, where Jesus said, I will give you and you and you and you and you, I will give all of you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind shall be bound. Whatever you loose shall be loosed. <laughs> it's up to you whether the kingdom of God is going to be reflected in the earth. Luke 12 and 32, God is pleased and said to give you the kingdom. So he, then he goes on to say, see, that's what we read. God is pleased to give you the kingdom. Oh, God is pleased to give you the kingdom. The rest of the verse says, so sell everything you have and give to those who are in need. We don't read that verse, that part of the verse, because we like that the kingdom has been given to us, but we don't like what it means that the kingdom has been given to us. The kingdom has been given to you so you can reflect the, ki the kingdom. The kingdom is not reflecting by you loving the things of this world, by you hoarding the possessions of this world, by you searching and seeking out the things of this world. But the kingdom is reflected when you seek first his kingdom by giving up whatever needs to be given up in this life, sacrificing whatever needs to be sacrificed in this life so that the kingdom of God can be seen. First Thessalonians 2 and 11 tells us to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom. We are heirs of the kingdom that promised to those who love us, James 2 and 5 says. Luke 18 and 30 talks about an exchange that is made for the kingdom of heaven. And when you make an exchange, I think that scripture talks about whoever gives up lands and wives and sisters and brothers and family and things of this earth and for the kingdom of God shall receive more in this life and in the life to come. When you make an exchange to be a part of this kingdom, Kingdom, you receive more, not less. It's up to you, it's up to me to see whether or not we're going to see this kingdom in operation in our life. Now, I said all that, we're about to close. To get to this one point, I want you to hear me. Does the kingdom of heaven begin at the end of the world when we get to heaven, or did it begin already? Did it already start? I've come to tell you today, your inheritance has already been started because of what Christ has done for you. Right now, you can get a foretaste of what will be fully in operation in the physical. You can get a foretaste of that right now. It's already been given to you in the spiritual. And when we look at the passage of Scripture that says, do not be deceived. Well, first of all, let's go back to it and let's really look at it. It's not going to take me long. Paul says, do, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? What's he talking about? 
See, when we read that scripture, you know what we say? Yep, those people who are unrighteous, those people who do wrong things, practice wrong things. We all do wrong things. We all fail. That's, so the scripture is not talking about people who ever did something wrong. It's talking about people who practice doing wrong. Those of you who practice doing wrong, you know it's wrong, but you don't care. You do it anyway. It appeals to your flesh. You get pleasure out of it. You're going to do it anyway. Those who practice doing wrong, knowing it's wrong, knowing what God said about it, but you continue to practice it, those people, he said, will not inherit, will not receive an inheritance called the kingdom of God. And we will look at that and we will say, that means they won't go to heaven. <laughs> but it's deeper than that, y'all. Now, let me keep saying this because I'm getting ahead of myself. The next part says, and don't you be deceived. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Christians now. Those people who are in the world who are unredeemed, who are doing wrongdoing, they can never experience, they can never taste what the inheritance is that comes from being in the kingdom of God. But I don't want you Christians to be deceived either because you who fornicate, you who idolize, you who are slanderers, you who are liars, you, if you are practicing and living this way, neither can you receive your inheritance. Somebody missed that. <laughs> so the unredeemed, the unbelievers are unable to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of heaven that he is offering not to come, but now. They can't receive the benefits. Here's the, here, I'm going to share some of the benefits. There's a sweet peace that surpasses all understanding. That is a benefit, an inheritance of being a part of the kingdom of God. There is a contentment a true contentment. There is a rest. There is a joy of the Lord. There are covenant blessings of favor and prosperity, which includes not just money, but health and quality of relationships. It, it, these are benefits of being a part of the kingdom. If you're part of the kingdom, there is freedom from fear. There is freedom from guilt and shame and regret and hopelessness and insecurity and not being loved and valued. All of these are benefits of being a part of this kingdom. God, you can access the benefits today. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. You can access the, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's been made available today for you to have all of these things that God wants to pass down to you. Today you can have them. The writer Paul, however, as I said, goes to tell the church, it's not only those who refuse to place their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who cannot experience the blessings and benefits of God's amazing kingdom, but it's also those who have believed, who practice or participate regularly in these types of behaviors. Because these types of behaviors separate you from the kingdom of God. Now watch this. It doesn't separate you from a place. It separates you from a person. Because the kingdom of God is not just a place, it's a person. A person who has all of this power. A person who has all of this presence. A, per a person who has all of these blessings. So when we behave in ways that are not godlike, we are unable to experience or enjoy the kingdom's benefits or the kingdom's blessings that have been promised to us. For example, let's give an example and I'm almost done. When a believer is engaging in fornication, for those of you guys who don't know what fornication is, that is sex outside of marriage. Any type of sex outside of marriage, the Bible refers to as fornication and refers to as a sin before God, okay? So when a person is engaging, a believer in particular is engaging in fornication, when he engages in that behavior, number one, if he's a believer, he is grieving the spirit of God. And he is grieving the person of Jesus Christ. He knows it and inside he is guilty he feels condemned. He has no, or she has no peace. 
They no longer have confidence in, confidence in God's ability to bless them. Then they're tormented by accusations of Satan. Now they're open up to mental health attacks and physical health attacks. And now they fall into bondage to evil spirits that they've opened themselves up to. And while they're experiencing all of this, how can they experience the benefits that come with being a child of God? You can't experience, God wants you to experience the benefit. God don't try to take all the fun from you. God's trying to get you to experience the benefits and the, 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 the blessings that come with being a part of his kingdom where he rules, where he's king, where he wants the best for you, where he wants you to experience that true commitment, where he wants you to be secure, where he wants you to know that you're loved, where you have all the comfort you need, where you have all the joy that you need, where you have the peace that surpasses all understanding. He wants you to experience all of that. He don't want you to miss out on any of that. All of these things that you inherit from being in the kingdom of God. Paul, as I close, was not as much concerned with the church being able to enjoy the inheritance of the kingdom of God in the future. He was more concerned about getting the church to see that they're missing out on their inheritance now. If you're only thinking about the kingdom of heaven that's coming in its full measure and the total package of the inheritance that you already gained in the future, then you're missing out on what's available to you right now. And the only thing that can stop us from ex experiencing the benefits and blessings that come with God's kingdom is wrong behaviors absolutely nothing else but our obedience and our love for God and our faith it gives us access every day to all of the kingdom benefits that will one day be realized fully and completely and totally in the end I want us as a body of believers to start using the benefits that God has already given us today I've worked at places before where I was getting a paycheck and I was happy with that paycheck because it was a nice paycheck. And I didn't even realize all the benefits that came with my position. So what? I could have been using dental. I could have been using health. I could have accessed this. How could I have missed all of the benefits that came with my position? And that's some of us in the body of Christ as believers. We got benefits that we don't even know we have now. We're working towards something that God has already given us. Who wants to start your benefits today? Maximize all the benefits you have in the kingdom, because you're in a kingdom. You're not in the, don't think I'm in the, you're not part of this kingdom of this world. So you don't, the benefits that come with the kingdom of this world, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the benefits that come with you being in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, I already have all my kingdom benefits. Stand to your feet. In Jesus' name, lift your hands.